Welcome to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions webinar series. I'm Lewis Cardinal. I serve on the Council's Board of Trustees. Following today's presentation, you will have time to take questions from our listeners. At any point during the webinar, you may type questions into the box on the screen. Today's webinar is entitled Interfaith Social Media, Interfaith Leadership in the Digital World and features Frank Fredericks. Now I'm honored to introduce Frank. Frank Fredericks is the founder of World Faith, Sonyar Records, and co-founder of Religious Freedom USA. After graduating from NYU, Frank worked in the music industry managing artists such as Lady Gaga. In 2006, he founded World Faith, a youth-led interfaith organization active in 10 countries. As an active blogger, Frank has contributed to the Huffington Post, Washington Post, and Sojourners. Frank has been interviewed on Good Morning America, NPR, New York Magazine, and various international media outlets, and is an IFYC Fellow alumnus, as well as Sonia Fellow and Youth Action Net Fellow. Frank also works as an independent online marketing and PR consultant, consulting nonprofits, corporations, foundations, recording artists, and political campaigns on web issues ranging from viral video and social networks to SEO and advertising. He resides in New York, New York, where he still performs as a professional musician with local artists. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. So, let's go to here. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Um, today I want to talk, as mentioned, about interfaith social media and specifically how to be leaders in this digital world. So I'm going to be moving pretty quickly today. Um, so I want you to think about today as an opportunity to just rethink how you look at these technologies because the technologies we talk about can change very quickly. So what's important is how we think about these technologies. So as new technologies begin coming out, you can be prepared for them. What is the Twitter going to be in, in 10 years that is today a simple uh, status update? Well, you know, what is the technology that we can't even imagine? The way we think about these technologies will be very important. Uh, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as mentioned, founder of World Faith, Sonia Records. I co-founded Religious Freedom USA with Joshua Stanton. I'm executive board member of Global Tolerance, and uh, I do social media marketing, PR. Um, and here's a, a sort of a snapshot of some of my clients, some of which I'm assuming uh, are on this call, and maybe you'll recognize a few of them. So I have a very short video to get ready. Um, this idea of challenging you know, what is technology. Så 
说话又比较厉害。So what this video uh, outlines to us in a very goofy way is this question of technology. Typically, when we think of technology, we think of, let's say, our iPhone or the VCR or DVD player or the microwave. But these are just pieces of equipment. Technology is the actual information or knowledge that we have that allows us to use them. Uh, imagine giving a microwave to somebody in the 15th century. It wouldn't be technology because they'd have no use of it. So our mind is where that technology lies, and I think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. So we're going to look at three different frameworks to look at technology. Um, the first is strategies versus tactics. The second is looking at Marshall McLuhan and, and his philosophy. And third is just basic marketing theory. So first, um, strategies versus tactics. Um, the word tactic comes from Greek tactica, meaning of arrangement, and answers the question, how? Um, let me go back on. I missed. Great. So strategy, on the other hand, comes from the Greek strategos, which means uh, general, like a, as, a, as a military leader. So they would see the field of play from above and be able to really um, lead things on the question of why. So the reason why this is an important framework is I've had many clients come to me and say, Facebook, uh, we need to be there. And, and my question is, well, well, why? What do you want to achieve by being on Facebook? And so what, uh, many times people see these technologies which have tactical use, but they don't engage in an actual strategy of what they want to get out of it and why they're using it. So I think it's, it's something that's important. We'll come back to this a few times. So a quote on this um, coming is, uh, is from Niccolo Machiavelli, who is one of my favorite uh, strategists. He who suits his actions to fit the times will not prosper, but he whose actions do not accord with the times will not succeed. The last frame we'll be looking at is Marshall McLuhan. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was um, basically popular from the 50s to 80s. He was a philosopher, educator, and really probably the most pivotal person in how we look at communications and, uh, and media. Um, his two main ideas was hot media versus cool media, and the medium is the message. So first, let's look at uh, hot media. So hot media is defined as any media that enhances by a single sense uh, and that doesn't require much effort for somebody to envision the details. So imagine an action movie. You don't need to imagine much because it's probably pretty graphic what's happening in this action movie with, with all the fight scenes and everything. But because it has so much uh, sensory overload, you're also not participating very much in it. Cool media, on the other hand, requires a certain level of detachment. So when you listen to the radio and they're describing something, we have to imagine that. And, and that requires a level of participation from us. The, e the evening news, when spoken, uh, is, a, is a great example. Uh, here's a quote from Marshall McLuhan. Any hot medium allows of less participation than a cool one, as a lecture makes for less participation than a seminar and a book less than a dialogue. So the other framework we're going to be looking at is the medium is the message. Now this is something that uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan proposed that he's probably most well known for, but it's something that I think is more relevant today than it even was in his time. So his, his self-described quote on this is, um, the dominant communication media of our time will shape the way humans think, act, and ultimately perceive the world around us. Technologies, from clothing to the wheel to the book and beyond, are the messages themselves, not the content of the media. So the best example of this actually is Jesus. Uh, was Jesus the message or was Jesus the medium? 
well, in a sense, he was both. And, and increasingly so, we're going to be looking at how technologies themselves impact and become uh, essential to your messaging. Lastly, uh, marketing theory is a way we want to look at all this. So uh, we're going to give you a crash course in marketing in the next two minutes. Um, the important things are research, segmentation, values of your constituents, and then media placement, which in this case will be social media. So um, the first thing you want to do is create some really great research. So if you, let's say, have a, a hundred people who you're, let's say you have a hundred congregants or constituents, who are they and why are they involved in your organization? So I would create a survey. You can use SurveyMonkey. You can use a Google form. And you should ask several types of questions. One are, are um, you know, demographical type questions, you know, age, location, uh, maybe income level, race, gender, um, rural versus urban. We'll, we'll get more into this. Um, you want to find out their values, um, what's important to them. And lastly, you want to know what media they consume. And we'll get dive more into all of those. But really, the question is, who are you trying to reach? Do you want funders, volunteers? Do you want to, are you trying to get press, um, online, uh, activist help? So let's look at segmentation. So finding out who your community is will be very important because um, when you do this, let's say you've got um, 100 people you're working with again. Well, if you want to make that 1,000, Finding out what those people have in common and then what, are, what values are, are interested in or, or, or valued within that community of people is very, very important. Um, also, sometimes you have um, one segment, which may be, let's say, your funding segment for, for some organizations, that may be in the 50 to 70-year-old range. Um, but as you've been growing and expanding, you want to make sure you're reaching millennials. So you may actually need to cater some of your, your technologies to reach a, a second group that you're not engaging in. So really being able to map this out is um, important, and that's why we ask the question, is there more than one segment to look at? Next are the values. Uh, what's important to the people that you're trying to reach? A uh, really good example is the Interfaith Youth Corps has their Better Together campaign. Now, they have a little bit of, uh, of two brands in a sense that they're engaging uh, and really putting out there. They have their, their uh, interfaith institutes, uh, in interfaith leadership institutes. And they're really, you could tell, they're catered to college kids who, who want to be cool. And I think that's pretty smart. Um, but they also do a lot of outreach with administration at universities. And that's when things like the uh, President's Challenge, um, uh, Obama's President's Challenge last year, really gave a level of prestige that made some universities want to get involved. So as you can see, there's two different value structures that are being engaged on. And this is the type of thing that you want to ask about your own um, outreach. The last step is placement. If you know what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, what values are important, the big question is where. So you know, what blogs should you be engaging in? What TV stations, social networks, uh, newspapers? And I think what's really interesting here is social networks play a huge role in this because um, there are places within each social network where you can engage people very heavily in a way that's very uh, beneficial, but it's also easy, and a lot of people end up having a uh, social network presence that doesn't work for them, that's not re reaching the right people. So this is a, a pivotal uh, thing to think about. So the technologies we're going to look at today are going to be search engine optimization, viral video, blogs, and social networks. Now, the title of this, of course, today is social media. And search engine optimization generally isn't seen as a part of social media. Uh, but search engine optimization is so important that I thought it couldn't be left out. So some of the questions we're going to be thinking about is, how does search engine optimization impact your social media? And how does social media impact your search engine optimization? Speaking of which, let's get right into it. Search engine optimization shorthand SEO, is based on the technologies that surround how search engines rank websites. This evaluation is done based on keywords, which appear in the titles, meta content, body, and links going to a particular website. Utilizing simple and free research, websites can be optimized to attract the highest amount of traffic possible. So your website should be getting 
about a third of your traffic from search engines. And if it's not, then this is probably a really important section for you to, to be paying attention to. So the process. Firstly, you're going to want to have Google Analytics installed on your website. Next, you're going to want to do keyword analysis. You're going to want to implement those keywords. And lastly, you're going to want to build some incoming links to your website. So um, here's a snapshot of World Faith's um, uh, Google Analytics uh, from the past month. And um, you want to know where your traffic's coming from, where it's going. Uh, the whole point of, of analytics is to really study how people are behaving on your website. Uh, and what's really interesting about this is you can also break it down by where they're coming from. So let's say 80% um, of people who come to your website uh, are bouncing, which means they don't go to a second page. So they spend maybe 10 seconds on your website and they leave. Well, if this is happening, where are those people coming from who are bouncing? Maybe they're not, maybe it's not even across the board. Maybe that's all your search engine uh, traffic. So what are those keywords that are bringing in people who aren't paying attention? And how can you focus your website in a new direction? So having Google Analytics is really important. Uh, to install Google Analytics, you're going to want to um, get the snippet from google.com backslash analytics and either put it into your um, header yourself or if you have a web designer, which is probably easier for, for many of you, um, have them install it for you, which should be very, very easy. Uh, next, keyword analysis. You're going to want to write down the, the general keywords that explain um, what your, your organization is. So it, let's say if I'm working with Faith House Manhattan, um, which is an organization I do work with here in New York. I might put um, um, experiential interfaith New York Manhattan um, and maybe a couple other key terms, tour bus, which is a big uh, uh, project that they've done. Um, you're going to want to write down these keywords and then you're going to want to go to the Google keyword um, tool. And what this will do is it will show you the general traffic around this keyword. Now, we sometimes language can make a, a little difference, can make a huge difference in, in, the, in the performance. So a really good example of this is I had a, uh, I did search engine optimization for a tour guide in Jamaica. And the term tour guide gets about 100,000 hits per month. Now, when I used the keyword, it told me that, but it also said, that the, the term travel guide um, gets 250,000 hits per month. So tour guide and travel guide almost sound like the same thing to me. But that little difference made actually a huge impact in our SEO strategy by, by using this new keyword tool uh, and engaging these, this new phrase. We were able to reach you know, a, um, a traffic search that was two and a half times the size of what we would have been able to. So, this is very important um, in every aspect of what you're doing. Uh, and then lastly, include, choose keywords that are page specific. So one thing I do a lot um, with my clients, with myself, with my own organization, is always, for instance, the board members uh, or our leaders, always put their search engine optimized up those pages for them. So put them in the meta content and the titles and, the, and all the other ways that you implement, uh, which we'll get into. Um, but a lot of your traffic is going to be based on people. Because ultimately, people are interested in people more than they are organizations or ideas. So being able to make, make the people search engine optimized will be uh, very, very helpful. Next, how do you implement this? Um, in short, you should probably talk to your web designer. Um, if you aren't web savvy, this is, requires things like how you name um, your pages. Um, so that's like the H1 headings for those of you. Your domain name makes a really big difference. Um, so you want a domain name that obviously is optimized for your organization name. Um, vanity URLs, that's um, the basically sub pages in your website. So you could, a, a lot of times, your CMS, which is the um, program that creates your website, will put in a little coded URL, which would be like, um, let's say, for me, worldfaith.org uh, or, or backslash, um, h7j hyphen k, right? Well, that's not going to do me any good. But if it says worldfaith.org backslash south hyphen Asia for our South Asian projects, 
that's going to be very helpful because anyone who's looking up anything in South Asia, we're going to be optimized for that. That helps. Um, next is, is um, high keyword density. You want to use your keywords. Um, and you want to use them pretty frequently. Uh, one thing that's really common is you know, when we write, let's say, a biography um, uh, on your website of your leaders, you generally use their first name the first time, and then you use their full name the first time. And then you use shorter names, you know, their first name or their last name for the rest of it. But actually, if you want to optimize that page for that person's name, you can write their full name every time. And that may look a little funny, but if it drives a little bit more traffic, you know, I think it might be worth it. Um, and even if you look at the title of today's session, I use the word interface twice. That's a, an SEO type of thing that you could do that helps. Um, you get bonus points if you install a sitemap. Uh, and Google announced last year that load speed is now important. So if you have a bunch of uh, large pictures that take a while to load, you might want to think about scaling those back. Or if you have a very, very long feed of, let's say, 50 blog posts on your home page, you might want to just limit that to 10 and click to a next page because uh, load speed is something that people are uh, paying attention to. The next step is link building. Um, you want incoming links to your website from reputable websites, it's really important to um, building your SEO strategy. So your social media should link to each other and into your website. Um, you should have any of your partner organizations, uh, friends, anything else, uh, maybe put a, write a blog post about you on their websites, uh, or if they have a, a friends uh, in action or, or anything like that, you know, link to their website, they can link to yours, that helps. Uh, and um, Lastly, for those of you who do write op-eds uh, or write blogs online like Huffington Post or Washington Post or uh, on the Parliament of World Religions blog, um, link to your organization or link to specific pages in your organization or to articles in your blog that are relevant. Uh, people are very link friendly today. Uh, they, they don't mind it because um, it helps their website in a sense too. And it's going to make a big difference for you as well. And the key thing about linking in is many times people want to link in the word here as the link. That's called the anchor text. The anchor text makes a big difference as well. So rather than saying here, put in the phrase that you basically want your website optimized for. Um, so if I'm talking about world faith, uh, rather than saying here, I, I, would, I might say, um, you know, example of interfaith youth development projects, because those are the keywords I want to refer to. Um, so how we want to think about this, we're, we'll use the marketing framework. Um, your analytics is, is basically acting like your, um, your marketing research. You're getting to see how people are acting on your website, and you should respond to that in kind. So if you're finding that you've optimized for a keyword um, that is not helping you, um, a lot of those people aren't coming on and doing anything productive on your website. They're just leaving or it's just not who you want to reach, um, then you may want to shift in a new direction. And this is something that's constantly evolving. Um, things slowly change over time. Um, you've got, there's new opportunities. Um, so this is the type of thing you organically you want to continue to work on. All right, next we're going to talk about viral video. Now I have a giant logo of YouTube here uh, simply because some 98% of all video views are on YouTube. Um, so this is just, it's become the standard and, and uh, a lot of what you're going to be doing is going to be on YouTube. So um, there's a general process here to making a viral video campaign. You want to choose a topic, the content, and, and really prepare well for it. Then you want to film and edit your video. Um, you want to explore what uploading tools you have. And lastly, you want to be able to track how people are responding to your video and adapt. So the development process. Um, what's your message and what are you trying to achieve out of this? Do you want a fundraising video? Do you want to raise awareness about a particular issue? Um, do you want to um, tell people about your just annual report coming out? There's a lot that you can do with video um, that I think um, is uh, more and more people are going to be doing communications through video. It's as technology is widened out, it becomes easier and easier. I believe video will become a much wider uh, standard. Um, how do you want to say it? Do you want something that seems more promotional? Do you want something that's funny? 
Um, you want something that's very serious. Um, really figuring out you know, your tone and format is going to be very important. And lastly, what do you need to make this happen? Um, do you need people, props? Do you need lighting? Do you, you know, what is it that you need and uh, resources to make this happen? Um, now, the most important thing I'd say here is um, people have a tendency to want to use a lot of facts. And this is one of those situations where you really should tell stories. Um, there's been ample research done uh, that I would explain, but I want to be conscientious of time. Um, but there's been ample research that's shown that storytelling uh, is very powerful and, and affects people much more than just um, direct information. So now you know what you want to do. Um, now it's time to shoot your film and edit. Um, this is something that could be done where you figure out, okay, we want to do something for our fundraising. We have a budget of $20,000. You could hire a firm who's going to do it, but you still want to be involved in the process. Or maybe your organization is very small, so you're going to do this on your own. Um, so I say keep things as simple as you can. Um, poor quality will distract from your message. So having something that's not too overly, you know, attempting to be too ornate, but really get your point across will be very powerful. Um, some of the best videos I've done have been people sitting down and um, just just talking about uh, reflecting on something important to them, and people have connected with them because they felt like they were in the room with them. You know, that wasn't a high amount of production value, quote unquote, but it really spoke to people. Um, also, real people talking is always better than bad acting. Um, and if you're doing this yourself, I, I would suggest a flip cam, but I know they've discontinued them. So if you don't have one, there's a Kodak camera that's very similar, but I think they've just got discontinued as well because Kodak is closing their camera department. Um, tough time for prosumer cameras. Um, but there are other similar technologies like that. And what you should do is find a tripod. If you can put it on a tripod, that really makes a huge difference. Low quality cameras can look really great um, with a tripod. And lastly, if you, you know, if you don't have Final Cut Pro or you're not really into video editing and you need to do it yourself, iMovie makes it pretty easy. Um, most of the World Faith videos that you, you, you'll find on uh, YouTube, we did with iMovie um, just out of, uh, just because we did it in-house and wanted to do it quickly and it made sense to us. All right, uploading. Save time. Um, there are many great tools for uploading on multiple platforms. As I mentioned, YouTube is the standard platform, but there's a lot of other websites out there that can help. Um, you know, there's Vimeo, there's Rever, there's Seven Load, there's Meta Cafe, there's a whole bunch of other ones. And essentially, you don't want to have to upload your video to ten different places. So you can use a tool where you upload it, and it uploads your video for you to these other websites. Now, for organizations, I believe two mobile charges. Um, so you have to look at those rates. And there's there was Vidmetrics, which was free, but they've closed down. So you just got to kind of keep an, an ear to, the, um, to what's going on to see if there's a free tool out there. Uh, and I, feel free to follow up with me afterwards. And I'm happy to look to see what's the latest. Um, what's really great about these tools, though, isn't the fact that they upload for you. It's that they also keep track of, your, um, of how people are responding. What type of views are you getting? Are people commenting? You know, are you getting positive or negative feedback? Because there's a thumbs up, thumbs down on YouTube and other platforms. Um, one second. And don't forget about meta content. Um, so meta content, once again, is your SEO keywords. Uh, people don't realize this. YouTube is a social network because you can make an account and have friends. It is a video platform, of course, but it's also a search engine. And it's not only a search engine, it's the second most used search engine in America. So next to Google itself, when people want to find things, they're increasingly using um, YouTube as a search engine, which means your keywords are extremely important. Also, if you're finding there's a viral video relevant to your topic, if you make your video a response video to that video, which you can do um, with a little link, and you use the same keywords, people will see your video in the suggested videos to the right of that video. Um, and that's a really great way to engage in the discourse happening around key issues on YouTube, which is very, very important. So how we're thinking about video is also important. Um, how is your message being adapted by the medium being used? Is this working to your advantage? Um, a great example of this is Fight Club. 
So I want you to read this quote here. And in just a minute, you're going to uh, hear, you're going to see this in video. Just one moment. So just a moment. It was preloaded, but now it's giving me a little trouble. You can't have a uh, session on technology without the technology not work. Let me start over. Here we go. Back up. Let me start over. For six months, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. With insomnia, nothing's real. Everything's far away. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. So there we have the exact same quote, uh, but in two different media. And the, this is where the idea of the medium being the message is. It, I don't know about you, but I have a completely different understanding of what he's saying when I hear his voice and his tone and I see the context that it's happening. And it has a completely different meaning. So video is a very powerful tool where you can engage people on an emotional level much easier than on an intellectual level. Um, and that really ties into that. Next technology we're going to look at are blogs. Um, this is pretty straightforward. I think many of you use blogs. Blogs are actually, once again, um, social media, but they are extremely important to social media. Much of the content being shared on social media platforms are blog posts. And I think uh, it would be imprudent of you to think of your social media plan without engaging in blogs. So the, the general process here is you need to make a blog if you don't have one. There's how you need to write a blog. So it's how, how do you promote your blog posts. And lastly, how do you utilize RSS feeds to do work for you. So making a blog is pretty straightforward. You should find a blog host like WordPress, Tumblr, um, there's Blogger, there's a few other out there. You need to find a name that um, makes sense for your blog. It could be your organization's name. But there's also other ways you can do that. Um, SEO is going to be very important as well to your blog name. And next, you're going to want to find a template that matches your tone. Um, uh, sometimes the, the built-in you know, templates are, are kind of bland, and uh, you need to find something that really matches what you're, you're doing. Um, and for instance, you want also maybe a, if you're, if you're a campaign-based organization, you're going to want to have a template that can match for several different types of, con you know, of content. Um, I mean, the, the tone and template that is appropriate for, um, let's say, a youth campaign may not be the same um, that uh, would be valuable for um, engaging the issue of, let's say, um, sex trafficking. You know, I think being aware that there's these different types of issues you're engaging in and being able to have something that's flexible enough for them all is very important. Um, to your template, you can add links to your social media, make sure you have an RSS feed link, and uh, I even like to add a Twitter feed so people can move directly from our blog and engage on our social media. Writing on blog. Um, you need to decide on a tone that matches, of course, as we mentioned before, and that goes into your branding overall. It should be part of your um, style guide. Um, most blog software, these, these such as WordPress, which I strongly suggest, have the categories function. And you can use this to your advantage. Um, categories are not mutually exclusive, so you can have news, stories. Uh, I use video and, and photos as, as tags for any article that have those. Um, and, and categories are great. You can use them. They, they have their own RSS feeds, which we'll get into in a bit. 
but for instance, our website um, are actually the news and the press are updated based off the categories of our blog, which makes it very easy. We never have to update them. We'll get into RSS feeds in a bit. Keep it short. Um, a lot of your posts can only you, know, you keep it to 200 words, maybe 400 to 600. Um, you know, just make it very, very punchy. And if if you feel like you're going too long, you can always make a blog series. You know, where you talk about the issue in a separate part um, way, and then link them to each other. Mix up the content that you're using. Use video. Use pictures. Uh, include them in, let's say, a, a short um, written blog post as well. The content that you're writing on. Um, you know, try to be relevant to what's happening today. If there's something in the news that's relevant to what you're doing, engage in that issue. Um, talk about it. Even if you're not taking a position, you can comment on the different sides of that issue. Um, but having relevant content is not only important on the blog, but it's great to get your constituents engaged off the blog. Um, and if you're ever not sure, think of yourself as the reader. What's vital and, and what is it that you would want to hear and know? And lastly, once again, tell stories. I can't emphasize this enough. This, the power of a story is, is I, I can't overemphasize that. Next, promoting your blog. Tell your friends, coworkers, collaborators, family, volunteers, tell everyone. If you have an email um, blast, you should announce that you have a blog if you haven't already done that. You should include snippets of your blog inside your email um, posts and then link to them so that people read the first paragraph, they get interested, and then they have to click the link to go to your blog in order to, to read more. Um, invite others from other organizations to write for you. They, they'll be much more likely to promote your blog if it has their content up. And it creates a, just another way for you to engage people in, in, uh, both online and offline. Keep your blog up to date. Um, some people get really excited and they write five blog posts in like a three-hour period, and then they go a month without writing anything. Um, really be good about spacing out your blog posts uh, and find uh, you know, a good rhythm that you can keep. Um, what's really great about most blog, uh, blog software is that you're able to actually sub um, to schedule them. So let's say I do write five blog posts today. I can schedule one for every day this week instead so that I don't have to actually come in and sign in at each point that I want to post them. I can just tell them to automatically happen. And lastly, utilize RSS feeds. So RSS feeds uh, are, it stands for really simple syndication. And it's useful for readers and it's useful for you. So first of all, anyone can subscribe to your blog. Because of that dynamic content, they can take the URL and they can get an email every time that you write a blog, or many people have an aggregator that brings in all these blog posts from everywhere else, and they can make sure that yours is on their aggregator. Um, you can also import your blog to Facebook. Um, they may have changed that on fan pages now. I, I haven't figured out how to get around that. I'm sure somebody, Matt might even be a good resource on this, because I'm trying to figure out how to adapt with that one. Um, you can use Twitter feed to have your blog posts automatically tweet. Um, and people can have their, their um, RSS feeds go to the phones, email websites, all over the place. Um, it's a really great tool just to connect anything. It, it makes it easy for you because you don't have to actually tweet and Facebook and, and email out this content every single time. Um, also, RSS feeds work between social networks. So for instance, uh, I have one project where the Twitter updates the Facebook, and then I have another one where the, the Facebook fan pages updates the Twitter. So it's, um, it's, you can connect this in any different ways, but the point is you want to make it as easy as uh, possible for you to be able to share the most content on the most platforms without having to do it yourself. So let's look at a framework here. Um, strategies versus tactics. Blogs are extremely versatile. Even if your blog is popular and well executed, have you asked yourself, how does this support our strategic communications plan? So it's important to think about how this is matching your greater plan. If you have a really well-read blog and it's not connecting um, on your core mission in a way that you're able to measure, you might want to rethink how you're using your blog. So the last technology I want to get into is social networks. Um, social networks are where the rubber hits the road. You can recruit people, you can organize people, you can send reminders, and you can, re you can promote very well. 
So using social media, uh, social networks for recruitment, you can recruit. You can recruit by creating viral content. Um, viral content is essentially word of mouth in the digital age. Remember, no one likes being advertised at more than you do. So use these tools in a way to find out who you're trying to reach and engage them. So maybe you're looking for volunteers, or you're looking for donors, or you're looking for just people who are advocates for you. You can organize people on social networks. Um, you know, you can use a Facebook group for people who've met um, that you want to continue to have working together. Um, you can even uh, you can have a hashtag for an event to organize you know people's tweets at an event. Um, social networks really are great for organizing people. A whole different set of ways. There's a lot you can do with this, and that's a, one of those conversations that can be uh, continued afterwards. Uh, next is reminding. So probably for most of you, you can only call your constituents and ask for money once a year. You probably can only email them once every month or two. Um, and then when it comes to actually um, you know, sending out a, a Facebook update or a tweet, you could do this much more frequently. Um, people are not as bothered by it when it's done in this very non-invasive way. Uh, which is great because you can remind people that you exist and that you know you exist on their their donations uh, or tithes or, or whatever it is for your organization uh, very well and it's not as offensive as calling people or sending them emails because people can get turned off by that very easily so what's great is once again that these technologies change how frequently you can engage people you can't send out an email three times a day but you can certainly tweet lastly is uh, promotion Social networks are becoming increasingly relevant with search technologies. There are uh, Facebook-based and Twitter-based search engines um, that are very, uh, very good at extrapolating what's happening in real time and, and having content that really taps into what's happening that day is, is very helpful. Um, also, having clear and professional social media uh, is really important to your branding. And, and because these are platforms that are very flexible, you can be very, very um, professional, all the way to being very relaxed, non-formal, on Twitter, on Facebook, in a way that really uh, is great. I mean, if you think about it, Twitter is a platform that both the White House and the White Stripes use. The White Stripes are a band, if you're unfamiliar. Um, now, also, with your social networks, as I mentioned, import your, um, your media from other platforms with your RSS feeds. You can set up YouTube to automatically um, tweet for you as well. Um, we talked about how your blogs can do this. If you use Flickr, you can similarly set that up. Um, it's, once again, these, all of these technologies should be interacting with each other as much as possible. So let's look at social net networks with the marketing framework. Who is our audience? What social networks are they using and how are they using it? So once again, this comes also back to this idea of, you know, are we engaging the right people in the right way? Are we really reaching them with their values? And this marketing framework is a really great way to look at social networks. So these were just four technologies that I quickly um, um, showed here. There's a bunch of other technologies that you should consider um, some of them social media and some of them just online. You've got Constant Contact for email marketing, Flickr for photo sharing, Neem to create your own uh, social network, Peace Next by the uh, Parliament of World's Religion is one of those. I think it works quite well. You have Hootsuite, which can be a social aggregator that you share across multiple platforms. You can have your events um, on video live with Ustream. Um, you can do databasing with Salesforce or Salsa Labs. Can be a, you can do online fundraising with, with uh, websites like Kickstarter. You can manage tasks at your organization with Asana, which I'm currently just in love with. And you can use Wiki to even collaborate uh, with people you know, uh, wide and far apart. Also some reading for those of you who want to spend more time rethinking about um, your approach to technology. Here's a few uh, books. The medium is the message. Uh, the typo is actually how it originally was published. I, there's, I think there's an inside joke there somewhere. Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, and A Whole New Mind by David Pink. The last one I, I strongly suggest reading because it, it really deals with 
how people are, are increasingly using right brain functions based on the technologies around us. It includes symphony, um, play, storytelling. Uh, it's a really great book. I strongly suggest anyone doing communications or social media to read that book. Here's a shameless plug for World Faith. Um, I, World Faith is a youth-led interfaith community service and development organization. We're working in 10 countries. Feel free to, to follow up and learn more about that. Um, here's our website. And of course, if you want to see how we do our social media, uh, feel free. And lastly, I know I just put out a lot of information really quickly and didn't get to spend a lot of time on anything. Uh, so what I want to do is create an open dialogue with any of you. Um, here's my email, frank at worldfaith.org, um, facebook.com backslash Frankie Fredericks, Twitter, Frankie Freds. And also you can see my articles on the Huffington Post backslash Frank hyphen Fredericks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. That was a very insightful and fascinating uh, presentation. Now we have time for a few questions from our listeners. So please type your questions into the box on your screen, the chat box. And we have one question already hot off the chat box, and that is, what are some of the most effective ways for building a base in Twitter? Hmm. This is a really good question. Um, you know, this goes against Twitter's uh, terms of use. <laughs> um, but what I have found is that works, uh, if you do this on a small, small scale, just um, maybe 100 people or so, is, um, is you can actually find a related organization or a Twitter feed that's similar to your organization or at least reaches similar people and follow their followers, um, maybe like 50 or 100 of them. And you'll be surprised a lot of those people will follow you back. Um, now, until you have 2,000 followers, you can't follow over 2,000 people. And if you were to try to follow that many people in a short period of time, they will shut your account down. But long story short, um, that's, uh, that's one quick way to, to jumpstart it in the beginning. Now, there are some more traditional ways to also uh, build your Twitter following. And I think it's really how you think about the technology. Um, so often, a, a lot of my clients who come from business, they, they think about the same technologies that were offline, online. So there was a billboard, now there's a banner ad. But what's really great about online technologies, and Twitter I think is at the forefront of this, is that we can reach many people while seemingly being very personal. Um, so I remember um, some of my favorite musicians will talk about very mundane, very personal things, um, even though there's three million people reading. And uh, I think that's worked really well for them. Um, now obviously for organizations you don't want to do that, but you do want to ask questions, you want to engage people. Feel free to retweet what other people um, are, are doing and respond to those. Uh, and, and when you engage in conversation, when you realize that Twitter especially is a two-way conversation, uh, you're able to get more people who retweet, you can have great conversations, and then when they retweet you, their followers will follow you. And it's about really creating this organic conversation. Now we have a question from New Jersey. The question is, how do we attract people to a blog? How do we transition from a print-based audience to an internet audience? Great question. So the number one thing I would say is stop thinking of your, your blog um, as, the, the point isn't getting people to your blog, it's, it's getting your content to people. So your blog is located in one place online where people generally aren't coming. So take your content where, where those people are. Those people are going to be on Facebook, they'll be on Twitter, they might be on, there might be um, other social networks that are um, important for your sub-community. There might be, um, let's say, Huffington Post, you know, in the comments or even if you're able to write an article there. Take, you know, your content and share it as much as you can off of your blog, that link back into your blog, so it makes it very easy for people to find you and you're, you're starting and meeting them where they already are. Thank you, Frank. Now from New Mexico, do you have thoughts about how film can serve a mission of interfaith education? Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I would say is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not huge on dialogue. It's not a term I use. Um, and I'm not big on also like an academic approach. So I'm saying that so my bias is clear. But what video can do very well is humanize people. And more and more research is showing that 
it's not just you know, it's not how much people know about Islam in America, for instance, that um, dictates how people feel about Muslims. It's whether or not they know a Muslim and if they've ever been to a mosque. So human experience trumps information. And I think um, you know, through documentary content, through um, storytelling, if you can humanize people, um, which video does very well, then I think that's the best interfaith education you can create. All right, so we have a question from Switzerland. How can organizations communicate through the current mediums of technology without betraying their grassroots methodologies? Hmm, that's a really good question. Well, we have a term that we use, uh, that I love to use, and it's called Machiavelli for a cause. Um, so sometimes, you know, you have to kind of engage a little bit in, you know, taking strong stands, um, pushing out. I mean, a really good example is, uh, is change.org. They send out emails almost every day. Um, they have really catchy titles on their emails. Um, their social media is constantly running. And I would still say they're a grassroots organization. Um, another organization that I think works amazingly well at this is Avaz, A-V-A-A-Z. Um, I've met Rickon before, the founder, and uh, I was just struck with how well they got so many people involved and yet really maintain this air of, of activism. And so, and, I, and I, in a sense, I, I, maybe I'm equating this wrong, but I consider activism or any action that you're, you're developing as grassroots. As long as we're not just talking about policy, to me it's, it's pretty grassrootsy. Um, so that's how I'd approach that, is really think, how can you scale up but still matter and still be encouraging people to act on the ground? Okay. There's another interesting question from Virginia. Can complex spiritual concepts be adequately covered in social media? And if so, what techniques should be used? Hmm, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question because I don't, a lot of the content I'm, I'm working with, a lot of my clients are many times interfaith organizations from a civic point of view and not necessarily creating um, quote unquote spiritual content. I know there's a huge space for that out there. Um, obviously networks, which is the, I would imagine, largest interfaith uh, media uh, and film based uh, organization out there. Um, their most popular video on social media is a, um, a video that people watch in the mornings with some basic quotes. It's, it's very spiritually uplifting, and their spiritual content actually does very well. Uh, I know on YouTube there's a lot of other content like that, so I've seen I've seen it work well, but it's not something that I've worked closely enough to know how it works or why it works. So this is a more direct question. How do you convince people who are scared of using social media? Well, um, this is tough because um, sometimes when I, when I map it out, I end up scaring them more. Um, but I basically say, you can't afford not to be online anymore. I remember when online advertising used to be called new media. Um, you can't call online advertising of any kind new media anymore because actually, Online advertising is a bigger business uh, than offline advertising now. People spend more money advertising online than they do offline. So this isn't, this isn't new media, this is now media. Media has gone online. Um, and I think the reason why we're seeing uh, on cable networks, uh, on newspapers and what have you, become uh, very extreme in their views is simply because they're trying to remain relevant in the post-digital world. And, and now. You, you can't afford not to be online. Um, I think what I try to do to, to not scare them, though, is spend some time with them, um, slowly showing them the technology, and, and getting them comfortable with it. Uh, a really good example is, I don't know, some of you may or may not know Debbie Amantasa, who's a great activist here in New York. Um, I have a lot of respect for her. She uh, came to my office, and she asked me about Twitter. She's like, I feel like I should be on Twitter, but it really intimidates me. So. We spent about 20 minutes. I showed her how to use the, uh, how to use Twitter, and she now has like five times as many followers as I do. She's tweeting all, all day, all night. So what we find is once people get used to these technologies, people um, who maybe aren't native to these technologies from older generations, 
They love them. And actually, interestingly enough, Twitter, their average users of Twitter are, I think, in the 35 to 45 year age range. Um, because it's such a it's a it's a simple, easy to get platform that's exciting to use, whereas Facebook can be very convoluted and complicated. Okay. Now from the United Kingdom, the question is, do you have advice for building blog relationships and getting content on other websites? Absolutely. Um, you know, everything that you do, um, especially in your outreach at an organization, but everything in life uh, is all about relationships. So if you want to have a good relationship online, you need to have a good relationship offline. Um, despite the fact that these days I'm doing, um, sometimes doing 14 hour days, six or seven days a week, every week I try to have one phone call with somebody at an organization that I haven't spoken to before. Just to say, what are you doing? Here's what I'm doing. How can we work together? And this, the most simple way that people can work together is share each other's content on social media, blog for each other, and share each other's content. Um, this is, it's, it's very easy to do. And, and when you look at those many times who are, um, come from an opposing viewpoint of people doing pluralism or interfaith work, they're very well organized and they know each other very well. We need to be that organized and connected to each other as a movement to be effective. And I think that starts with something as simple as writing on each other's blogs. So simply, if you know those, what those blogs are, write them. Ask them if you can uh, submit something to their blog or if you'd like to write on, uh, or if they'd like to write on your blog, et cetera, et cetera, and really engage them. Um, and then from there, I'll let that initiate a conversation that you can continue. And I think it can only get better from that. Your uh, presentation has generated a ton of questions. Uh, we're being flooded with questions here, so we try. We tried our best to get to some some important some of the important ones, uh, even though they are all important. But we have time for one more question, and uh, this one is: uh, Our organization has struggled in getting people to leave comments on Facebook. Do you have any advice to increase engagement? Hmm. So there, there's three things that come to mind. One is, uh, it might be the, the constituents you have. Um, you know, I think there is a generational thing about commenting. I think people, I want to say maybe 35 and below are really comfortable commenting. Um, and sometimes the uh, older generations are, are, are less interested in that no matter what you do. So know your audience and, and I think it's important to map out what's possible and not possible. Um, but the next thing is, is um, there are ways that you can help to get people commenting. One is people won't see your content on Facebook from a fan page unless they're engaging with it. So you need uh, people to, you need to have content that people are finding and coming to and then once they start to do that, the, the Facebook algorithm will actually allow your content from your fan page to show up on their feed. But unless they're doing that, they're not going to see that. And most people don't comment by going to a, a Facebook fan page. They comment by seeing that content on their feed. So it's an important first thing. The second thing is, is that um, you, you know, pose questions, um, incentivize it. Say the, uh, the first person who, um, or the 10th person who comments on this will, um, you know, will get free tickets to an upcoming show or I don't know, or, or your benefit or something. So play around with it and see if you can incentivize it in a way. Um, and lastly, I would say, um, you know, just keep trying different things. If, if asking questions doesn't work, post articles that might be interesting or intriguing. Maybe even things that are a touch controversial. Say, okay, we don't, we're not supporting this idea, but how do you respond to this? And that works really well as well. Well, Frank, thank you so much, and thanks for sharing your your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience uh, with social media. I found it to be very informative and quite fascinating, actually. Thank you. And it's been such an honor. And once again, I want to apologize to all the folks who have sent in uh, questions. Uh, we couldn't get to them all, of course, or we'd be here all day. But I want to thank you all for joining us today for this talk with Frank Fredericks. Uh, please join us for future webinars, which you can learn about on our website at parliamentofreligions.org. We also invite you to stay connected to the interreligious movement through our email newsletter and by visiting our social network at peacenext.org. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on our website within the next few days. If you'd like to review it or share it, 
with others. That'd be great. Now, in closing, I would uh, like to share the vision of the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions is a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. We work to cultivate harmony through the world's religious and spiritual communities and to foster their engagement with the critical issues of our time. We send our thanks to all of you who are doing your own part for a better world. And once again, on behalf of the Council, thank you for joining us today.